Today, as we uh, start a new sermon series in the light of the Lord's second coming, the sermon series is entitled The Lord's Table, and we'll be dwelling on this theme, the Lord's Table, in the next few weeks. And for that, let's turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 9. Luke chapter 22, verse 9. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. Where do you want us to prepare for it? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And we ask you, Lord, that you lead us in the mysteries of your word the mysteries of your communion. And help us, O Lord, accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's start with the slide, the photo. Okay, so this piece of wood is a rectangle, and it's called tabulita. Okay, let's all say together, tabulita. Okay, the question is, this is a quiz question, okay? Quiz question. Uh, so where do we see this tabulita? Where do we see this tabulita? Any answers? Where do we see this tabulita? Any answers? I know one of one or two of you have answers, but you're not saying. Oh, you're more past it to you. Okay, Micah. Huh? On the TV? Like now? Like as if now? On the TV? Oh, you're so smart. No wonder you get so ardy, so much addies. And your hand was up there. <laughs> on the TV. Yeah, isn't it obvious, Achan? It's on the TV. But other than that, where do you see the tablita in the church? Like other than the TV, okay? Probably on the altar, right? Probably, and that's a good, your mom told you, I know. Uh, probably on the altar. So, let me look at you. So, where on the altar is he? Now your mom should not say. Mm -hmm. Mom is not saying anything, because I am looking at mom. Okay, let's leave that. Like, don't say now, don't say now, okay? Okay, where on the altar? Any guesses? Let's do the guessing game. Where on the altar? Oh, well, you know, you have to take all the classes. <laughs> yeah, Lenny and Lenny Cheji said that. Under the bread and wine. Where is the bread and wine? Show, show, show with your hand. Like, say, show. Where is the bread and wine? Yeah, it's, it's there, right? It's in the center, like covered with a cloth. The cloth has a name, Shoshapa. So there is a bread and wine. And under the bread and wine, there is this wooden plank. Quiz question answered. Okay, good? Okay, so you know, as we go in the uh, sermon, I will tell you. So that was a quiz question. So today, you know, as we dwell on this theme, the Lord's table, I want to concentrate on two aspects, uh, you know, where and how. Where and how? And normally, you know, we take part <clears throat> in the Holy Kurbana with an attitude to go and take part of it where the Kurbana is happening, right? And we know where it happens. Um, we know it happens in a church. We know the time. Like, where, when does, what is the time of our Holy Kurbana? What is the time of the Holy Kurbana at Crossway Church? What is the time? 10.30. It's good to remember that next time when you come to Kurbana. It's 10.30, okay? So, that we know it's in the church, we know the time, and, you know, we know what takes place. You know, some, some sort of idea is there. But sometimes, you know, we have this, you know, what I call sort of look and sort of syndrome, like a don't know syndrome, right? When Achan does things, and, you know, when Achan, like, you know, turns around. There are times when Achan turns around, right? And Achan does this 
What is this? <laughs> what is this? Is it like a baby? Hi, hi, hi. Hello, how are you? I see you there. Hi, hi, hi. Is it like a baby hand, something? What is it like? What is it? What, what, what is it? No, no. What is it, Gia? This baby hand. Don't say anything. I know the answer came from there, but Gia, what is a baby hand? Is it like Achan saying hi? Is it Achan giving high five from distance? What is a baby hand? I know your mom told you. Keep quiet. You know. <laughs> What is a baby hand? So, you know, uh, the baby hand, I mean, the, the, this, this gesture is not a baby hand. You know, it's a gesture of blessing. And it's a gesture of blessing. So, like, you know, when Achan does like this, it's not a baby hand or a long distance high five. It's a blessing of God. So, you know, your mind should be, in your mind you should be, oh, what is Achan? No, it should not be like that. What is Achan doing? Uh, what is this? <laughs> you know, your mind, your, your mind should be, oh, Lord, I accept this blessing. Your mind should you know, think like that, oh Lord, I accept this blessing. You, you should say to yourself, Lord, I accept this blessing, okay? So that is, you know, what, you know, like so, sort of a syndrome of don't know syndrome. You know, Ajahn is doing something, everybody, and I, I can see the looks on the faces, okay? <laughs> like sometimes, you know, we, we give this, sometimes like all kurbana we give, what is this called? You know, when the Ajahn turns and gives something, what is it, giving shake hand? The kiss of peace, right? It's a kiss of peace. Right, and uh, you know, these are some of the things and a lot of things that happens uh, within the Qurban. You know, uh, the kiss of peace, uh, you know, we, I don't know, we should just say, what, what is the kiss of peace? It's all based from the Bible, by the way. It's not just random things that once upon a time, the early fathers thought, oh, let's just put it in there. No, these are based on the Bible. The kiss of peace is an early Christian tradition that we see in the Bible. And Paul says, greet each other with a holy kiss, right? Greet each, each other with a holy kiss. It's based from the Bible. It's based from the Bible. It's not like random thing put in, in there. It was, this was things done in the biblical times also. And the kiss of peace is, you know, the forgiveness of God. Like, that's why we have the altar, the throne, the cross. The forgiveness of God, Achan is taking it and symbolically giving it to Jones or Ashish uncle or Anand uncle and giving it and they are coming and giving to you you all, and you give to each other. The forgiveness of God. So today, you know, when you do that, when you turn to the person who, and you give the kiss of peace, you should say to the person, I am sorry. Do you agree to do that? Even if it's your sibling, you agree to do that? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, just turn to the person who is standing or sitting next to you and just say, when you give your hand, say, I am sorry. That's what it means. The forgiveness of God that comes from the cross, the Achan gives to the lay leaders, and so that the church will forgive each other, the kiss of peace. So there are a lot of, lot of things, you know, happening in the Qurban as we come, and, when we, and we are uncertain of these things, and as we learn about these things, you know, we, we understand it more deeply. You know, but there are, there are some things, you know, that are certain, amidst all this doubt that we have about Qurbana, amidst all these uncertainties. The certainty that Kurbana reminds us is the certainty of the Lord's coming. The Lord's table reminds us the certainty that our Lord is going to come once again. That's why Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Not in the remembrance of just what God has done for us. That is a cross, that is his passion, that is his suffering but also in remembrance of what God will do when he comes back once again. Do this in remembrance of me. So every time when we stand in the communion, it should remind us of the passion of Jesus, the life of Jesus, but it also should remind us that one day a God is going to come once again and do the things that he said he will do. This is the certainty. The certainty that when our Lord comes back in all his glory with his angels, that those who are dead in Christ will be raised. Those who live by grace through faith will be raised. This is the certainty that the Holy Communion should remind us. Remind us. You know, in my ministry, you know, as, it, as it is with the ministry of we Achins, there have been instances when we have to take, you know, uh, the Holy Communion to the sick, 
you know, there have been instances, it, it does not, it doesn't, like, it doesn't, we think the Holy Communion happens only within the church. No, there have been instances in my life, in my ministry, that we have to take the Holy Communion to the sick. Where does Kurbana happen? That is a question. We are certain, we are always certain that Kurbana happens in the church space. But beyond that also Kurbana happens. There have been instances where I have been soaked in water when I was taking Holy Communion. And it was not an ice bucket challenge. You know, it was not that I took the ice bucket challenge, I was soaked in water. No. I was traveling on my bike and all of a sudden the rain gods decided to pour the rains. <laughs> like I got drenched. I got fully drenched. But I reached there, I had to take Kurbana, communion. How do we take part in the communion, right? And by the time the communion was over, all of my clothes were dry. <laughs> How do we take part? There have been times when I was involved in taking three Kurbanas in a day. Three Kurbanas in a day. There are so many experiences, but all these instances, no matter what state I was in, drenched or not drenched, taking the third Kurbana or the first Kurbana, the time, the place, and the way of doing Kurbana was certain. It was happening in a church or probably with a sick person. That was a time. That was certain. I was certain about it. But as against all of our notions of certainty as to where Kurbana has to be celebrated or how it has to be celebrated, there also exists an element of uncertainty. And it is to that element that we should think today. An element of uncertainty that is associated with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Where and how? And it exists through the pages of the Bible. And that is a word that Paul uses. The word is mystery. The word is mystery. Associated with communion and the experience of communion. Here, you know, in Luke chapter 22, we hear this question, where do you want us to prepare for it? Prepare what? Prepare Passover. Verse 28, we read Jesus saying, go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. Here we see an uncertainty in the question, right? Today, the modern world is so certain of what, where the Kurbana happens and what happens in Kurbana that we refuse sometimes, or we are ignorant sometimes to dwell on the aspect of mystery in the communion. Here in this question, it is a question of uncertainty. The place is uncertain. The disciples are asking the Lord where they have to take Kurbana, or where they have to take the Passover, which is the basis of communion in the New Testament. You know, we like to know everything, right? The modern world has taught us, until and unless you understand the meaning, you know, you don't understand the meaning, then, you know, everything is ritualistic. We like to know the meaning of everything, but there is an element of mystery involved in communion that we cannot decipher, that we cannot decode. That is an element of mystery. And the modern world will never agree to that mystery that the Holy Communion brings. The Holy Communion brings. We like to micromanage everything. But you have forgotten that there is this element of mystery that the Bible reminds us. You know, for example, the bread and wine. Right? The bread and the wine. You know, our church, the Marthoma Church, believe that it is symbolic of the body and the blood of Jesus. Bread is the body and the wine is the blood. But the Martha Machas doesn't put it in a framework, oh, it is only this thing. No, 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 no. The Martha Machas dwells on the mystery that, yes, it is symbolic, but there is also a presence of Jesus Christ in this bread and in this blood, in this wine, that we cannot understand. You know, the Catholic Church, they say, oh, it, it actually becomes flesh. It really becomes flesh. It really becomes flesh. Literally, that is what the understanding of the Catholic Church is. But our church, we say that it is symbolic of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. But we don't put it in just that framework. We say there is a mystery involved in this. And this mystery, only the spirit will reveal to each one what is this mystery. Nobody tries to decipher it. We don't try to decode it. 
We are not certain. That is an element of uncertainty involved. That is an element of mystery involved. Yes, this is bread and wine, which is symbolic of the body and the blood of Jesus. But that is also a presence of Jesus in this bread and wine. That is a mystery involved in this. Where modernity tells us to understand everything and understand the meaning. And I only have to understand the meaning, do it. That's why baptism is so controversial, because we don't want to dwell in the mystery that happens in baptism when the child is baptized. It is God who acts, not us. It is God who acts. We, are, we want to be certain of everything in life, of what is happening, what is the meaning of this. And all of a sudden, the mystery element from Christian life is gone. And if you, I want to take your minds back to what you know, Pastor Chan said. That's what was happening in the early church. That, you know, the believers used to come, used to come and take part in this bread, take part in this wine. It was a mystery. It was a holy element, symbolic and representing the presence of Christ. There was a mystery involved. This was the faith of the early church that we today, because of the worldview that we live in, have forgotten the mystery. The uncertainty of Kurbana has to do with mystery has to do with mystery. Kurbana reminds us not to be always in control. And it's with the, you know, the attitude of the human, the modernity, that we want to be in control. We want to know the meaning. We want to know what's happening. We want to be in control. It, at the base of it lies that we, 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 I want to understand this. It's rational, right? What is wrong with it? Isn't it like logical? I want to understand it. What's wrong with it? But at the base of it also lies that I want to be in control. It is I doing all the controlling thing that stops us to dwell in the mystery of God. When we dwell in the mystery of God and let the presence of God speak to us in a way that we cannot even understand. God is in control. God is in control. The spirit is in control. We don't put a framework to what happens to the holy elements. We don't put an understanding to what happens to the holy elements. But God is in control and God decodes to us in our life what that mystery is. We want to micromanage everything. That's in a part of micromanaging. So this is what we have to think. Like, Are all these habits, this, this, this thought frame, stopping us from experience the fullness of God? You know, these are some of the habits we have. Micromanage, you know, we want to control everything. We want to understand everything. And then we will agree to some things. In, in Christianity and spirituality, this is what we have to think. Are these habits stopping me from experiencing the trust in God? Stopping me from experiencing the control of God? This is what we have to think. This is what we have to think. Can we give our controlling habits, our understanding, into the presence of God? Into the presence of God. And so amidst these mysteries of life, amidst these uncertainties of life, we have to follow the guidance of God. It's not blind faith. Blind faith, the word, you know, it can be positive or negative. But, you know, we have to trust. Trust is a much better word. Trust in the leading of God. The holy elements reminds us as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's second coming, we have to be guided by God. We have to be guided by God. You know, the uncertainty of the mystery of worship or Holy Communion points us to, you know, the fellowship that is here. And that's why I said, you know, today when you give kiss of peace, say to each other, I am sorry. I am sorry. The fellowship that is existing in communion reminds us of the love in communion, reminds us of the sacrifice of communion, reminds us of the thanksgiving in communion, reminds us of oneness, reminds us of forgiveness. But this is what we have to ask ourselves, does it, does it like start and end within these four walls or does it go beyond these four walls? That's the essence of communion. Because our modern world has confined the communion to this space, we can't even think of taking these taking this, this, this meanings of love, of sacrifice, of forgiveness, of oneness, of thanksgiving beyond the four walls. Beyond the four walls. And so like as Crossway community, this is what we have to ask ourselves. Can we celebrate the Lord's table beyond this church? Not only in, in, in values of 
forgiveness, love, sacrifice, not only in values such as those, but also actually, literally, can we celebrate the Lord's table beyond these four walls? Beyond these four walls. Beyond these four walls. Look through the pages of the Bible. The people who lived their life, they lived in the guidance of God. Noah, right? When, when the Lord told him to build an ark, the uncertainty of whether the wood will be available, whether the animals will come, if the animals came, whether the rain will come, the uncertainty, that in the pages of the Bible, this uncertainty lies etched that the modern mind cannot decipher or understand, but it is only revealed by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Look at Abraham. He was called to go from the Ur of Chaldeans to the land that I will show you. Guidance. The modern mind has you know, formed a framework of our mind in such a way that we cannot see this reality in the pages of the Bible that there is a mystery in the guidance of God. That there is a mystery, an element of trust. An element of trust. So that's the uncertainty. One, uncertainty or the mystery associated with the Lord's table as we wait for the Lord's coming. And second is like, you know, how? How we should celebrate? Here in this prep, here in this preparation, there is a preparation of uncomfortability. They are, they are like journeying with Jesus. They are journeying with Jesus. And it's all based in the Old Testament. It continues from the Old Testament. In the book of Exodus, right? They are called to, you know, to go out, to go. They're called to leave everything or pack everything as fast as they can and go. And before you go, what are they asked to do? Celebrate the Passover. Celebrate the Passover, which is the Old Testament roots of the Holy Communion. Are we ready as a church for an exodus? Kurbana should make us uncomfortable. It should make us uncomfortable in the sense that sharing this Kurbana outside this church. Not only in values such as sacrifice, love, but in actual. Can we as a church think of, you know, can I celebrate communion? We go for street evangelism by the grace of God. We go to the homeless. To, you know, this is a part of our mission. Can we celebrate communion in the actuality, literally there? An exodus as we journey with God. Look in today's uh, gospel portion, you know, Jesus is sending them. They are on a journey. See, that's what the Tablita Palaga reminds us. This Tablita Palaga has a history. You know, the Tablita Palaga is, it signifies the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Jesus Christ. So that's why it is made of wood. It signifies the cross on which he was crucified. It is a reminder that our kurban or communion is a sacrifice without blood. That is based on Hebrews. All throughout the Old Testament there was a blood, you know, all sacrifice there was blood of lamb or goats or bulls. But here in the New Testament there is a sacrifice without blood because of what Jesus did on the cross. And as we celebrate, as we give thanksgiving, the sacrifice of praise to God, the tablita palaga on which the body and the blood is there. It should remind us through Jesus we are able to lift our sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice without blood. So this is the spiritual meaning of the tablita palaga. But also historically in our church, the Marthoma church, there was a time we didn't have churches. You know, back back in 1800s. We didn't have churches. We didn't have space. So much uncomfortable, right? Here we are, we, are so, we are so happy in the coziness of this space, this AC. Can you imagine celebrating Kurbana without AC, without any defined space, without any defined, you know, sometimes. So in the history of the Marthoma church, when the Marthoma church started, there weren't any churches. So they, we, our ancestors, this wood used to be there. Even if there was no four walls of the church, even if there was no altar or the throne, even if nothing was there, this wood, this piece of wood was there, signifying the cross of God, signifying the sacrifice of Jesus, and they used to put the body and the blood, you know, the bread and the wine there, and they used to celebrate communion. It just reminds us that in our history, in our history, our forefathers, foremothers went on this journey of uncomfortability and see and look to us how comfortable we are celebrating communion. So the answer, one, the uncertainty, but also the uncomfortability. 
As we are getting comfortable more and more, this tablita palaga should remind us of the journey that the biblical pioneers had taken, that the early church had taken. It should remind us, look at, look, look at the Bible. It's a, Bible is filled with journey, starting with Exodus, or even before that, Abraham. Then we are coming to Exodus. And then, you know, as the journey goes, see, they are celebrating Passover. They don't have confined walls. They don't have a space, defined space, but they are celebrating Passover. And look at Jesus in the New Testament. He's coming. He's in this three and a half ministry. Don't you think that he broke bread? You have seen chosen, right? You have seen chosen. What happens in that? He breaks bread as they are on the journey. And here in this portion, just before he was going to be you know, crucified or he was going to enter his suffering, he is breaking bread and giving wine on a journey. And today we celebrate communion just where we are. But, and the early church, and the early church, they journey, they didn't have any churches. They used to gather in houses, and they used to gather together, and they used to break bread. That's what Acts teaches us. They used to break bread. The Tablita Palaga reminds us of the spiritual and the historical faith where people used to journey, and they used to celebrate communion. And that's what the Lord's table reminds us. As our Lord comes back again, we have to journey from here to where our Lord will take us. This is a question we have to ask. Are we doing these journeys? In the actuality, literally also. Like our mission, mission fields is like where street evangelism is, you know, here in Dallas, where, you know, where we go to a homeless. Can we think of literally celebrating communion there? You know, the other day, you know, you all know that you know, I'm involved in now as chaplain. The other day I was talking to one of the youths, you know, and he was saying, oh, you know, Achen, it would be good to celebrate communion once there. In the college. In the college. Uh, you told me that. Our faith is not a faith that gets comfortable within the confined walls of church space. The biblical faith is a faith that takes the journey and celebrates communion as they journey. As they move along. As they move on. As they move from one place to another, they are breaking the bread. You know, taking part of the wine. But what is happening to us today? Are we just like moving on after every kurbana? Like a checkbox thing? Oh, we did kurbana, checkbox. Okay, let's get on with life. As they moved along, they used to celebrate kurbana within their experiences. So it is not just a spiritual meaning, but also the actual meaning of kurbana, the actual deed of kurbana. This is what we have to think in our life. One is the uncertainty or the mystery. Are our minds so modernistic, so modernistic, ideologistic that we want to understand everything and decipher everything to meaningfully partake in worship. Are our minds like that? Or are we giving the control to God? God, I want to understand everything, but I know you are in control. Yet your spirit teach me the mystery that's involved. And second is the uncomfortability. How we should celebrate communion. Are we so comfortable Listening to the songs that we like, listening to the genre of songs that we like, listening and or being situated ourselves in this cold AC room here. <coughs> you know, the other day I went to Diocese Youth Conference and you know the students, the students' dorm didn't have AC. They didn't have AC, you know, and they had all in their notification, if possible, you know, bring what is that, Four, those fans, right, portable fans. Everybody thought it was a joke. But it was real. They didn't have AC. There was some, some power, some problems that was happening in that side. Are we so comfortable living the Christian life within our own comfortable zones that we have forgotten the journeys that the biblical fathers and mothers have taken and amidst that journey, they have broken bread and they have shared the wine. This is the history of communion. Can we come to the Lord in prayer? And as we look to the Lord in prayer, ask Him. Ask Him to guide us. Ask Him to be in control. Ask Him to help us understand not with our human minds, but with the Holy Spirit whom He has gifted us to guide us into the mystery of faith. Can one of you lead us in prayer?